speaker series. Unfortunately, one of our panelists, Greg Harbutt, can't join us tonight, but we still have an outstanding panel for you. If you explore the topics diversity and inclusion in horse racing, very few articles, especially ones related to the sport here in the U.S., can be found. In fact, most of the information is fairly recent and probably includes a quote from one of tonight's panelists. Why has horse racing not been the leader for the other national sports in our country? If you go to any racetrack backstretch, you will see a very racially diverse workforce. Yet, that diversity is not translated to representation in positions of leadership, management, power, and influence on the front side. Why has it taken racing so long to address this topic? How does the industry embrace and facilitate change? One of our panelists, Jason Wilson, wrote in a letter to the editor in Thoroughbred Daily News back on September 25th. It is, quote, my sincere belief that the sport will not be able to grow without an intentional approach to attracting a more diverse fan base and workforce. It's also incumbent upon us to provide environments where people are comfortable and foster advancement for people from different backgrounds. Tonight, we've assembled an outstanding panel exploring how racing can grow through diversity and inclusion. Each of our panelists brings their own unique perspective and background to the conversation. I'd like to introduce you to our moderator, Alicia Hughes. Alicia is an award-winning writer and a reporter for more than 20 years of experience. She's previously worked as Director of Communications for the National Thoroughbred Racing Association, Racing Editor and Staff Writer for Blood Horse, and served as the lead turf writer for the Lexington Herald Leader newspaper for eight years. Alicia is currently the Digital Content Editor for the TVG Insider News website. Good evening, Alicia. Thank you for agreeing to moderate tonight's discussion. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Sean. And uh, again, my name is Alicia. My pronouns are she, her, hers. And I just want to thank everybody tuning in for listening and for receiving us tonight with empathy and in integrity. What we're going to talk about tonight may be triggering for some of you out there. And I just want to say that if you are triggered by anything that is discussed, that is okay. This work is hard, this work is difficult. I've been triggered like 10 times myself today, so I get it. So I want you all to know that I'm holding space for you if something hits you in a certain way. If it does hit you in a certain way though, what I would ask is that you don't kind of bury it emotionally, but that you sit with it and think about what is coming up for you and if need be, that you recognize your privilege and that you let that go. And if you are uncomfortable in this space, again, I really thank you for tuning in because no change happens in any space unless people are willing to get uncomfortable. Um, before we get in here, I just wanna say in general, discussions about diversity and inclusion often get very hyper-focused about around race or gender or gender identity. But what we are going to be talking about tonight applies to all marginalized and minoritized communities. And because focusing solely just on race is often a lot of times how a lot of homogeneous organizations dismiss a lot of other forms of workplace discrimination. And one of the best um, definitions I've seen of what DEI truly means is diversity is getting hired, inclusion is getting a seat at the table, equity is being at the table and having your voice heard. So we want everybody from all backgrounds to, be, to have a seat at the table in this industry and to be valued and to be heard. And with that, I'm going to introduce our fantastic panelists that we have tonight. We have uh, Jason Wilson, who is the Chief Operating Officer of First Content, which oversees the media and content rights of affiliated racetracks, Santa Anita Park, Gulfstream Park, Laurel Park, Pimlico and Golden Gate Fields, as well as unaffiliated racetracks. Prior to that, Jason served as a President and Chief Operating Officer at Decobase Company, the official database for thoroughbred horse racing, where he was responsible for developing and executing the strategic direction of the company. And prior to joining with Equibase, he served as president of the Jockey Club Media Ventures and vice president in, bu in business de development for the Jockey Club. We also have Ron Mack, who is the founder 
of the Legacy Equine Academy, which is a nonprofit based in Lexington, Kentucky, which I've had the privilege of being able to work closely with in recent years. Uh, LEA's mission is to connect African Americans and racially diverse high school and college level students by providing access and exposure to the vast professional opportunities that are available within both thoroughbred racing and the agricultural industries. Ron currently serves as the corporate and community liaison at Fayette County Public Schools, where his primary focus is a structured student pathway that will promote corporate and professional employment placement, including agricultural and equine career related opportunities. This position en endeavors to meet, in to meet industry workforce development needs and also create job pathways and initiatives. So Ron, Jason, thank you first and foremost for joining us tonight. Um, before we get into the questions, each of you just talk a little bit more about the work that you all are doing and why DEI is such a, a critical part of that. Sure. Um, you want to go first? <laughs> um, so I joined uh, First Content uh, back in April, um, and this was a newly formed division within uh, the First Group, formerly known as the Sonic Group. Um, and we're basically our mission is to figure out a way to advance racing um, visually through data, through other information, um, and we're, we're we're still kind of trying to figure out exactly what all that looks like uh, in the future. We recently hired a CEO um, uh, a couple of months ago. Um, we're both UCLA grads, so we actually work very well together. Um, but we're, 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 as, we, as we put that together, one of the things that we're very much focused on is what is the culture that we want to have in our organization, right? Um, I think that, you know, I've, I've only worked for a couple of organizations in racing. And I'll say that uh, the experience with respect to a focus on culture simply isn't necessarily there, or it is based on a culture that is very traditional and has been around for decades, right? So this is a very, very interesting um, situation in that we're, we're starting a new business and a larger business, and we can really focus in on how we want our workforce to be empowered and how we want, um, how we want them to really show up in the world and represent not just Stronach, but also horse racing. And that includes having a very diverse um, uh, workforce, given that we are in Los Angeles, Miami, Maryland, San Francisco, some of the most diverse places in the country. We want to make sure that our workforce, our fans, represent the communities that we're actually in. Ron? Well, um, as uh, Alicia uh, uh, mentioned, founder of the uh, Legacy Equine Academy, and uh, I would be remiss if I didn't give you a, a bit of a, a background as to uh, founding the organization. Uh, I actually grew up on the grounds of the Kentucky Association in Lexington, Kentucky. The Kentucky Association is actually Keeneland before Keeneland. And so several years ago, as I began to research uh, the history of the, those, uh, those days, I, I, I came to understand uh, the, that we were so what I also, though, uh, learned in my research is the dominance of the black jockey back then. Um, the first jockey to win the Kentucky Derby, Oliver Lewis. Uh, there was 13 of those 15 jockeys in that race were African American. 15 of the first uh, 28 uh, jockeys to win the Kentucky Derby were black jockeys. But not only were we jockeys, uh, we were uh, trainers and farriers and groomsmen and owners, believe it or not. We had a stake in the claim back then. Now, there was no diversity or equity, but there was a bit of an inclusion. And those jockeys were America's first great athletes. And so I wanted to put together an event to pay homage to those jockeys. But as things evolved, I wanted to include the industry in progressing to put together the event and, and so as we did that, through further research and conversations with top people in the industry, such as Seth Hancock, who's uh, a renowned horseman, um, we come to learn that we, as black people, went from dominating the sport in the late 1800s up until the turn of the century to be, be an instinct extinct in it from every level, from the corporate suites 
to being jockeys. And so we wanted to put together an organization that connecting that heritage and that history to today's standards in the industry. The equine industry is a microcosm of the business and, uh, business and economics in itself. And so we wanted to teach young people the, all the assets that they have, they can apply towards this particular industry. This industry in which they have a connection to in their lineage. And so we began to work with Fayette County Schools at the middle school level and developed a curriculum and a pathway and a pipeline for these kids to understand all the benefits of being a professional in the equine industry. We have evolved over these last five years to where we have kids who have gone through the program and have even given scholarships because that's our end game, to give scholarships, to offer job opportunities, and so we have widened our footprint in many ways as far as extending to the Louisville market and also expanding our reach to college students to get job opportunities, apprenticeships, co-ops, things of that nature. We've developed many, many relationships throughout the equine industry. And so I'm so proud to know and learn that we are extending the industry to a broader based audience that are, have really driven back in the late 1800s to what the industry is today. That's an excellent points um, from both of you. And Ron, the, you know, the points you made about, I said, the, the history of this sport and the fact that, you know, this is an industry that has literally been built on the back of the black community and people of color. Um, one of the first steps to improving diversity and inclusion is to talk about it, yet really it has only been in the last year and a half that the thoroughbred industry has even started having these conversations and acknowledging its issues with lack of diversity and inclusion. What evidence have you all seen that, that the industry is taking actual tangible steps to make itself more inclusive? Well, I, I think as far as, you know, tangible steps, there's, there's obviously no data to refer to. However, I do think that major players in the industry, such as uh, Churchill Downs, uh, the NTRA, uh, Keeneland, who Legacy works directly with, they have provided in these last couple of years, uh, at the very least, a platform to uh, have a conversation and to, you know, really look into how we can, as a community, uh, build opportunities within the industry. Uh, moving forward, beyond those platforms, we must see the needle move. And so that data should be established in the future, but at the very least, uh, the industry players at the highest level have recognized that there is a need for change. And I have many conversations with many equine related uh, uh, players from, from ownerships to farms to, you know, uh, the, the, all the acronyms of the equine right. industry. Uh, so uh, at least the conversations there, the platform is, has been built and so we must go to the next level and move forward in having some true tangible uh, uh, mechanism to change the sport in the way of diversity. Yeah. I, I, so I think that's right. I think if you look at it, well, first of all, we always talk about the industry as if it's one monolithic thing, right? The industry is actually a hundred small businesses that kind of work together, or hundreds of small businesses that work together to put on the show, right? So it's very difficult um, to get consistency across that wide range of, uh, of constituents. Um, with that said, in the last year or so, you've seen diversity as an issue at the Roundtable Conference that Jockey Club puts on, which I don't think you would have ever seen um, before last year. Um, you saw the HISA board um, that they created uh, through this legislation. The nominating committee was very diverse, and that was very intentional. Um, and they created a very diverse board that was very intentional. Um, Churchill Downs just, uh, just hired their, their head at diversity, um, which I hope doesn't become, you know, hey, we've got this diversity person, we've solved it. Um, I think these things need to be infused throughout the business in order to be successful, but it's encouraging to see 
that she reports directly to Bill Carstangen. Um, we're working on some stuff. Um, it would be premature for me to comment on it right now, but, but we are very much focused on how do we look at the community and how do we um, uh, take a more local approach to, um, to diversity. Um, and so I think you are seeing a lot of the building blocks being put into place. The question is what do we do with that going forward? And it's, it's, sometimes it's disheartening because you look at it, you look at other sports or you look at other organizations and they're way over here and we're way down here. Um, but you, know, you, can't, you can't knock progress. You have to just, just keep kind of encouraging it and, and hoping that it grows into something bigger. And representation is so key, we know that, but do we also, is there a fine line between making sure that they, that they don't get too hyper-focused on just the numbers, i.e., let's just hire a certain amount of individuals and make sure that the, fo that the focus is also on changing the culture of the sport to make sure that, you know, it's not enough to just say that the door is open. You have to make, they have to make sure that everybody who walks through the door actually is welcomed and feels supported when they come there. Absolutely, I, I agree with you. Um, until you change the culture, what have you actually changed? And so the culture needs to, to move forward with an exclusiveness, whereas it's not news. The other major sports, the NBA, the NFL, the NBA is international. The NFL obviously uh, has a, a, a true soap, soapbox to make sure that uh, not only players are represented, but management and ownership and all of that is represented. Even Bubba Wallace uh, was in the winner's circle in racing, mm -hmm. and I thought the most compelling picture of, of 2020 was the support that he received mm -hmm. uh, during that period of time. So the other sports are bought in. And so again, being the original sport of inclusion, why wouldn't horse racing, thoroughbred racing, uh, join in and, and again, have tangible movement from an ownership standpoint, from a uh, being in the winner's circle uh, standpoint, uh, from a management level. And so it takes effort that we have engaged in in these last few years uh, to move in that direction. Yeah. And so I look at it from the standpoint of, um, so I, sh I should say, I'm not a diversity expert, right? I'm a business person. And I look at things from the perspective of research and trends. Um, first of all, the research that I've seen shows that diverse workforces do better than non-diverse workforces. Uh, McKinsey has studied this several times over the past couple of decades, and it's the same conclusion over and over and over again. I look at a trend of this country is becoming more and more brown. And we need to figure out a way to embrace those communities. Otherwise, we're not going to have the best workforce, and we're not going to have uh, the fans that we need to sustain the sport. So you look at those two things, you have got to develop a culture that is inclusive and that is nurturing um, those types of environment. And it's going to be hard. It's not going to be easy. Some of these cultures have been around for decades, as I said. Like the jockey club is 130 years old, right? Um, they have an embedded culture. That is an issue for anybody coming into that culture, let alone somebody who looks like me um, or a woman or a trans person, right? So they have got to figure out how to become more welcoming or how to become welcoming, I should say, um, to, to people from diverse backgrounds. Otherwise, it's just going to end up more and more niche of a sport and, uh, and it's, it's just gonna wither on the vine. Yeah. I'd it, like to, to expound on that because you're making a great point. I think the messaging should be that DEI is not simply a defense mechanism for business and corporate and this particular industry, is that it's going to affect your bottom line. It will, absolutely. Because the population is evolving and is evolving very quickly. And so we must make the industry understand that you know, it's beyond just checking a box. Exactly. And to your point, I think, you know, I, I heard a stat a few weeks ago where this current 
generation, Gen Z, I believe, you know, they're going to be about 30% of our workforce in a handful of years. And this generation is all about inclusion. And if these, and if industries do not get on board with it, they will cancel you, they will come for you, they will ratio you. They, so it is, this change is going to happen whether people get on board with it or not. So it's, so it's, this is their point to, you know, where they want to decide basically if they want to do the right thing, both from a, from a moral perspective and also it's the right thing for their business. The, the other thing about it is I, I, I also think that culture matters just from the perspective of nurturing the individual, <laughs> not to like get too new agey, agey here, but, but at the end of the day, the only way that you're going to get the best work you can from your workforce is by having uh, a nurturing environment that is inclusive. Otherwise, it's just not going to work. It's going to fall apart. You're not even going to attract, you know, the, the white males that are out there because they're not going to want to come to work for that type of an organization when you have all these other organizations out there that are doing a better job of doing it. Exactly, exactly. And um, the point you made about, like I said, how crucial it is to the bottom line, I actually have some stats that kind of goes into that. The 2011 McKinsey report that was actually presented during the Jockey Club Brown Table actually stated that racing was losing fans at a rate of about 4% a year and that only 14% of the consumers felt that racing was a sport for them. Last year, that same McKinsey and company found that companies who were in the top quartal, who were the top quartile of ethnic and cultural diversity on executive teams were 33% more likely to have industry-leading profitability compared to those who were not. Given the numerous studies that show that businesses who embrace DEI show more growth and more profitable, are you surprised that maybe racing has not prioritized prioritized this sooner? Given you know that wanting to grow the sport, the sport has been kind of uh, you know, a main topic for some years now? Well, uh, you know, there, you know, we can't quantify it at this point. Mm -hmm. However, there's been some, some, some qualitative movement to where Bubba Wallace's team is owned by Michael Jordan. Right. Okay. Ray Daniels and Greg Harbert were owners in uh, of a Kentucky Derby horse. That's great stuff. And so to affect that culture, there must be representation. If there's no representation, then how can you assimilate? And so we need to continue that process. I'm on the management team of a, of a syndication uh, that's primarily minority owned or has diversity within it as one racing. And so it's an effort to make Ray and, and Greg and Ed Brown society, not just an anomaly, but a part of the industry. And again, that's how you move the needle because now you have a reference for younger people and a, more of a, of, a, of a love for the sport because you see your own participating in it at a high level. And so there are you know, things that can be done in the way of being a part of the sport and having the camaraderie and being in the winner's circle and understanding and having input into the culture. And so you know, the, the engine has been turned on, we got to make the car move. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think, um, you know, let's face it, a lot of these positions don't change all that frequently. Um, so even the opportunity to bring somebody in, um, it, it's not as frequent as you would, you would like or you would think. Um, but one thing I would like to see, somebody talked about this in the beginning, um, you know, the, the data and the information, right? If you could, figure out a way, like it's, it's almost like a, a think tank for these types of things um, that can get information like what you just said into the hands of management teams in racing because no individual management team has enough time or enough resources to, to get that information. But if, if you could figure out a way to distill that information and, and give it out to them, um, I think that would be beneficial. Um, I think if we, if this topic is brought up at the round, uh, not round table, well, well, yeah, the round table conference and the Arizona conference more frequently, just as other issues facing the industry are, and it becomes part of the discussion of 
of our business, then I think you're going to see more progress. Um, so I, I think it really just has to be how are we prioritizing these things and how are we discussing them and, 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 and can we figure out ways to get information to, to decision makers that it better informs them. In her statement on her decision to decline the tenure offer from the University of North Carolina, Pulitzer Prize winning journalist Nicole Hannah-Jones said, for too long, powerful people have expected the people that they have mistreated and marginalized to sacrifice themselves to make things whole. The burden of working for racial justice is often laid on the very people bearing the brunt of the injustice, not the powerful people who maintain it. With that in mind, quite frankly, should we even be the ones up on this stage right now talk, have, having to talk about this and answer these questions? The short answer is yes and no. Mm. We, 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 ha we have to be, we have to drive the conversation. However, you're making probably the biggest point of tonight, right now. Mm -hmm. In that if you don't have advocates at the highest level, the truth of the matter is you can't tangibly move forward until the people of authority, quite honestly, whether it be economic or, or otherwise, until you have buy-in there and advocacy at that level then you can't get to where we're talking about uh, this particular industry uh, and you know the economic industry uh, as a whole, as a country. We can't get there until those folks that we're referring to participate in the process. Yeah, and that's a great question. <laughs> um, so to put this in perspective, right, I joined the industry 10 years ago. And I've been to you know, 10 roundtable conferences from the Jockey Club, probably been to eight or nine uh, Arizona conferences. Um, when the simulcast conference was occurring, um, went to probably five of those. Uh, I've been to the Eclipse Awards, I presented at the Eclipse Awards. I can probably count the number of black people uh, that have been in all of those different events. And these are the influential events of the sport on one hand. Maybe two, but probably on one. Um, and there are years where I'm the only person there. It, it is, it, it, it would be incredibly naive of me to think that I, and, and incredibly, um, I don't know what the right word is, not right for the industry to think that I can carry all this water, right? So um, certainly this should be a discussion that the industry leaders should be having, um, or more of the industry leaders should be having. I'll tell you, uh, I've had discussions with you know the British Horse Racing Authority, um, and they've you know they've had their own moment. Um, and I think two or three years ago, they started uh, a, a program. I forget exactly what it's called, but basically, th they serve as that think tank for British racing. And they came together at the highest level to discuss these things and try to put, implement change. Um, now, they have issues trying to push that down to the rank and file, but at least you've got all the heads of the organizations together talking about these things. And otherwise, you're just not going to see any movement at all. Is that part of the problem that we don't have a centralized body like they do over there to kind of come together and, co and, and try to implement things widespread? It doesn't make it easier. <laughs> uh, but yeah, no, that is, that's part of the problem for a lot of things. I mean, like, racing has a lot of issues that could be solved with a more centralized body. Um, I understand why that is hard and why it, it, it probably will not happen, but it, it does make things um, a lot more difficult to get, th to get movement on any of these issues. And I said, since, like I said, right or wrong, the burden of doing the work often falls on us and people look like us. And I'm biased, I know both of you, I know the work y'all are doing and how hard it is, how rewarding it is, but how hard it is. How do we balance the desire to change things for the better in this industry for the next generation against, quite frankly, the emotional toll that comes with doing this work and knowing that it is not our job to heal these spaces? Uh, I, I think we, we, we need to uh, 
cast a wider net on those who are in these spaces of trying to make change. Uh, I had mentioned uh, the Ed Brown Society and, and As One Racing. Uh, there should be a, the development of many syndications, of many groups mm -hmm. to participate in the industry at that level. Uh, I think that you know conversations like this <coughs> and whatever successes that we do have moving the needle should motivate others to join in and, and provide a louder voice uh, to the cause, to the mission. And I think until you have that, uh, uh, I, I, I guess that you know uh, it takes a village concept. You 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 can't get there, or it takes longer to push. And and it, it's more, uh, as you had mentioned, it, it's tougher on those who are fighting the good fight. Right. Yeah. And I think um, if. One of the benefits of this past year has been that we've kind of all found each other, right? Um, at one point, I thought of creating the African Americans in Racing Association. I, my background, I was a, a lawyer for a number of years, then I was a banker for a number of years. In both industries, you've got affinity groups where you have a critical mass of employees from different backgrounds, have a group, and they come together, they have lunch once a month or whatever. Um, and I found over the course of my career that those were very, very good, safe places to discuss things like your career or, you know, you've got this partner who's just being a jerk and how do you deal with them and just get different types of advice. So I thought about, okay, can I create an African Americans in racing? And then I just, it would be me and like two people, right? So, um, so that, that never really went anywhere. But the last year has kind of galvanized this group of people to kind of come together and, and try to affect some sort of change. And that has been very, very helpful. Um, and I think the more that we can do, and even reaching down to junior people and mentoring them and helping them out um, and finding allies and finding you know, more of these safe spaces, that will help with the emotional toll of, of, of getting through all this. Stuff. I love what you just said about the safe spaces and everything. And, and please go ahead and start that group still, please, please. <laughs> I know, because I know you're not busy or anything yeah, like that and everything. But that, that leads into one of my next points was going to be is having that sense of, of community. I mean, me personally, it's something I haven't really ever had before. You know, I work in sports journalism. I work covering racing. Those are white male dominated industries. I've never had that sense of community before. How important is that? Like you said, you touched on that in having that safe space, having people, having people who are no, who are going to have you, you know, when no one else will, so, so to speak, when you're trying to do this work. Well, if you don't mind, I'd, I'd like to digress a moment, and, and I wouldn't be a, 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 a true uh, good leader of an organization if I didn't endorse uh, what we do. I must digress in that the, the mission of the Legacy Equine Academy is to uh, you know, reach out and offer excess and exposure to a younger generation. We got here mm -hmm. in this spot generationally over time. Mm -hmm. Until you can establish those kinds of organizations that you mentioned as far as African Americans joining together, you must have people who have a love for the sport, right? Mm -hmm. And so the love comes from being exposed to the sport. I mentioned the NFL, I mentioned baseball, I mentioned all of that. Well, we do those things from the start and we've always been involved in it at every level. That's where you have those organizations who are diverse mm -hmm. uh, uh, in their setup. And so what we endeavor to do is to build a whole new generation in our own small way at this point to have the love for the sport to want to be involved, to want to buy in, to want to carry it on, to want to fight and be advocates for it. And so that happens over time, but you cannot you know, develop that pipeline and that pathway right. without intentional effort. Right, yeah, you have to have intentionality. You know, it's funny, so I'm from New York and I've never really thought about horse racing growing up. Um, 
once I got into the industry, I started having more conversations with my friends. And, you know, one guy would say, hey, you know, uh, Jimmy Winkfield was my grandfather's best friend. Um, he used to come over for dinner all the time. Another guy would say, my, my uncle trained horses for the Rockefellers. My a friend of mine says, well, my grandmother used to run numbers for someone else, right? So we do have a history in this sport, and it's very sad that we've lost that history. And I have to commend you for trying to bring that history back together and made that connection, as well as the Ed Brown Society for, for trying to do the same thing. Um, but, but, but we have to be, and, and we have to create like this sense of pride with respect Absolutely. to it, right? Absolutely. It can't just be, um, you know, we're doing it because of, I don't know, just some commercial thing. It Absolutely. has to be more back to an authenticity that I think some of the programs that end up getting rolled out sure. kind of lack, right? Sure. So, so that's why our involvement is very important in Absolutely. these types of things, because it does give you that authenticity Absolutely. and that ability to say, you know, I, I, I got a call the other day. Someone said, you know, I, I read your article. This is a, a young Latina woman. I read your article, and I was so happy that you wrote that, because I, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to find my way in this sport, and I just can't, right? With, without us kind of being out there saying, this is a soft landing space, uh, we can help you, we can try to help you navigate these things, then it's, it, you know, it, it, it doesn't, it won't come easy. Um, but you do have to have the, the broader leader, leadership come in and, and support these efforts. Absolutely, and you know, since there is a, a lack of diversity in our, some of our positions of power and influence in this sport, what advice, if any, would, would you all have for somebody who maybe does not sit at the top of a totem pole in this industry, but still wants to affect change, who still wants to be, a, you, know, to, you know, like the woman who reached out to you, who still wants to make a difference? Well, I think it takes courage to effect change. Um, again, there, there are not enough uh, diversity in, in, in positions of power uh, to, to move the needle. But I think that, again, to, to drive this engine from a grassroot level, okay, and work from the bottom up as you're working from the top down. And so, um, from a DEI perspective, there needs to be intentional education. Because what I have found in, in this last five years with Legacy Equine Academy is that there is a lot of discovery in the information and the mission that we have, that people discover these positions within the industry that people discover the history and the heritage, that people discover that the opportunities should be there. And what you'll find is industry people discover right. again what the industry should evolve to because they see it as well as anyone does. And so I've been in many great conversations with people who want to support and help. And so again, we must build a bigger community of those folks. Mm -hmm. You can't have one here and one there wanting to do the right thing. You have to, to, to build uh, a, a majority to move it forward. Yeah. I'm gonna, I'm gonna bring it around to more general career, career advice, right? So if you're a, ju a junior person, you know, first of all, focus on doing your job. <laughs> Um, do the best job that you can, right? The second is, in order to get ahead in any organization, you have to build allies and relationships, right? And so as you do that, they should be people above you, people at your level, and people below you, and people inside and outside your organization. And as you develop those networks and as you develop those relationships, you'll find allies to help you with whatever it is that you want to drive forward, whether it's diversity or something else. And the more they get to know you as someone of character and quality, the more they are going to sign on to the things that you want to do. Um, and that way, you can, you can 
kind of push things along with your mentors and sponsors um, and not necessarily, you know, feel that you have to put your hand up every single time and say, hey, this was wrong or I'd like to do this or whatever. You can get the support of that person and that person can champion it with you. Um, and you know, I, I, that's worked for me in my, the course of my career in, in a number of different areas. And then I'll bring it back to something that we talked about earlier on the culture side. The culture, though, has to be receptive to, to those types of changes and to that type of activity. It cannot be as rigid a culture to just say, you know, we're not going to listen to you or we're not going to give you um, the time and the opportunity to build those relationships or to go to that affinity group that might be African Americans in racing that's meeting every third Thursday. Um, they have to be more receptive to those types of things. Um, but I think it's, it's definitely, you know, kind of a push-pull thing. And the idea of allyship, I mean, we, we've never gotten anywhere without allies. Have you had any um, techniques, so to speak, that have worked for, for you in your experience? If you're, try, like I said, if you're trying to get somebody to understand the importance of this who maybe be resistant to it, do you have any certain t t techniques that you've, that you've seen that has been successful to kind of get them to hear you, to understand you, and to, to, to re relate to you on kind of cross-cultural levels? Well, as far as our organization is concerned, uh, it's paramount that we provide value in what we do. And the value comes from at least attempting to be a part of the industry in these ways. Again, developing that curriculum that we have, the pipeline, the pathway to offer um, an educated, certified potential employees into the industry. Mm -hmm. Uh, personally, again, uh, uh, joining the management team at, at As One Racing to become a part of the industry. I think that that impacts the conversation, that there's value being offered back into the industry in your mission to make thing, to make change. And so it's the old walk in the walk analogy. Right. You know, I'll say, like, I don't think I've really met resistance, right? If, if, bringing it up, um, I've had very constructive conversations around the issue. And for the most part, it's met with a sense of, this is something that we have to do. Where it falls down is the follow through, right? So the technique is persistence, right? You have to continue to ask, continue to bring it up, and continue to figure out ways to kind of move the the conversation forward because I, I think by and large like people know this is an issue people want to do the right thing in general people get busy and so how do you how do you figure out the way to figure out how to kind of insinuate that is to get it back into the business discussion and say this is what we need to do in order to future proof our business going forward and that kind of gets people kind of thinking yeah, I call it sometimes, I think you've even heard me refer to it, I call it find what their pain point is. And, you know, if they're concerned about profits, if they're concerned about bottom line, show them this is how this can be a, a, a solution to that. And also, you know, don't phrase it and present it like a, like a problem. You know, this is an opportunity. This is, this is an opportunity to make your business, your space, you know, really everything around us better. And, you know, I've said, what in your experience are also some of maybe some of the other pipelines out there um, that exist for maybe fostering a broader fan base um, and, or a broader base of new talent coming into the sport that you feel racing should be reaching out to and establishing relationships with? I think that, um, again, there must be, the, the industry must be more intentional as to their sourcing and recruiting of those who potentially want to be in the industry. Uh, UofL has uh, an equine program embedded in their uh, business school. And so there should be support to recruit and source those African Americans and people of diverse backgrounds into the program. And so you have qualified, certified people to, again, move, hopefully, 
at some point into those spaces where they can make decisions on, uh, on the industry. And so, again, you must be intentional as to how you go about getting qualified uh, potential professionals into the sport, uh, whether it be from the farm uh, to the industry uh, to the race courses, whatever that it is. Again, uh, the industry is a microcosm uh, of our economy at large, so there are professional opportunities that once you know, people are educated that those, those possibilities are out there. And once those that are running those industry operations are more intentional, not just to put someone in place to say, hey, we have someone in place, right? But to have uh, a, a, a long-term sustainable uh, mechanism to grow the industry to a wider audience. Yeah, this is definitely a pipeline issue, right? You, you gotta make sure that like, racing is on people's radar when they're young, all the way through to their entire career. But I think, uh, you know, a couple of organizations, um, or not, not necessarily organizations, but the HBCUs, the historically black colleges and universities, um, produce, I think it's something like 40% of all black graduates. To not have them as part of your recruitment effort is a big miss. <laughs> um, so that so that there is 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 one area. And in most, at least in most of, I think in most of my tracks, there are, are HBCUs in the area. And in most most even in New York, you may not have an HBCU, but you've got a a college that is predominantly black, for more historical reasons. Um, so that's one. The HBCUs. The other one is. You know, I'm a member of, of a fraternity, and black fraternities and sororities are incredible, especially the alumni associations of black fraternities and sororities. If we could partner with, and they like to have a good time, if we could partner with them, that would increase our fan base. Um, and they, you know, we're talking about college educated professional folks who have disposable income, the sweet spot of any. Of, of any industry, right? So those would be the types of organizations I think that we should be looking to uh, foster better relationships with. What about from a marketing standpoint? You know, what, what do you think that the sport can do in terms of how it markets itself and how it presents itself to kind of, again, make things more, more welcoming? We're not good at marketing <laughs> in general. Um, but the model's out there. Oh, and the model's out there for and all the, these things, and right? And the, 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 the other industries, I, you know, uh, the, the model's out there is just, you know, the intention to make it happen. And so in these last couple of years, uh, there has been uh, a more uh, uh, intentional effort to um, pay homage to the African-American jockeys. Mm -hmm. I think that needs to continue. But again, that discovery point of marketing those many opportunities, I think that, and you've made a great point, um, you know, in my dreams as I think about the Legacy Equine Academy, I would love for those HBCUs to reach out to our program and in a, in a way of how can we help you build a pipeline to our universities because that's what we do in the way of our relationships with the University of Kentucky and Asbury College and, and Midway and, and, and of course uh, 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 University of Louisville's equine program is to again to reach back and develop that pipeline to another level and though so there's a bigger pool of folks that can move the industry forward. Yeah our, our marketing effort needs to take a step up generally. Um, but, it, it, you know, it goes back to authenticity, right? You, you can't just, like, slap a bunch of pictures together and, and put it out there, um, and then, you know, people get to the track, and it's very monochromatic, right? It's like, what's going on here? Um, so you have to have authentic marketing, and I think that requires the intentionality of 
you know, hiring experts in this field um, and talking, if, if, if you don't have somebody who represents that demographic in your, in your, um, around your table, you can find a consultant. You can find somebody to bring you some sort of expertise and some sort of knowledge around these things. Um, but I think in, in general, um, our marketing effort is not very good. I mean, it goes back to the original point. There's, there, there has to be metrics involved. Mm -hmm. Yes. There has to be a, 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 a data. Go ahead. So, to that point, like, it, it, it's mind boggling to me how little we know about our customer base in general. Um, and we, if somebody came to any track right now, or most tracks right now, and asked for baseline information about what is your demographics of people walking in that door, they don't know. They have no idea. And um, that, which is not measured, does not get progress, right? How, like, I feel like I keep asking the $64,000 question on a lot of these topics. Why hasn't that happened? Is that, I mean, is that intentional? Do they not want people to know, you know, because the numbers aren't going to shake out good Good for them. I mean, that, like you said, if we had that data, that could, like I said, open the door to so many things that could that that could then flow through it. You know, why? And you made the point on so many of these things. There is a blueprint in other sports. Like I almost feel like sometimes, if all they did is follow in the tire track, so to speak, of the other sports and other industries ahead of them, they would be so much yeah. further ahead than than where they are right now. Frankly, I think I, I think part of this issue. Uh, gets caught up in a larger issue about racing in general, right? And, and for whatever reason, the way that the sport has evolved, um, knowing who your customer was as they came in the door wasn't important before. So we don't have an infrastructure to collect that information. So it's not necessarily that they didn't do it because it's a diversity thing or it's a this thing. They just, for whatever reason, did not place any premium on that because they were a monopoly and the customers were going to come regardless of whether I know who they are or not, right? And that puts us behind the eight ball as far as trying to collect this information and put that infrastructure in place. But I wouldn't necessarily say that it's, it's, it, that it's a, driven by this issue. It's just this issue gets caught up in that aspect of it. Does that make sense? It does, and, and I agree with what Jason said. I, I would profess to be a, an expert uh, in, you know, building that, that marketing concept. However, uh, I do agree with what you're saying. Mm -hmm. We've obviously talked a lot about how hard this work is. What do your moments of joy look like in this? What, 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 is, what have been some of the more rewarding experiences that, that, that you've had, yeah, I said, you know, in the space and doing this kind of work? In the, the diversity space? Mm -hmm. or, or, uh, yeah. Or the horse racing space? <laughs> you, can go, you, you can answer both. Can I go first? Sure. Um, I, I have two uh, uh, moments uh, that Legacy Equine Academy has experienced. Quite recently, we've had a, uh, a young lady who started in our program in middle school and uh, went through uh, the program and continued uh, through the high school level. And uh, we were able to support her uh, in uh, giving her a scholarship in ag science, uh, industry-related major. And so when you start a pipeline at the middle school level, okay, that takes time to filter those folks through. And so to have our first scholarship recipient start the program in the middle school level and be able to offer her a scholarship to you know, further push her in whatever direction she chooses to go. Well, that, that's not only, you know, uh, a, a, it's emotional. Mm -hmm. Because it's good work. The other uh, uh, really highlight uh, here recently is that uh, we've had a member of uh, Kingland Association join the uh, Legacy Board. And so, again, these two points, you know, brings into focus of the overall point that I'm trying to make. And that the first is, we have someone 
that went through our program that has been or potentially a new audience, a new advocate for an industry. But from the top down, we have a major player in the industry. It took five years work mm -hmm. to join us in what our mission is. It's good stuff. I hope you'll agree. So yeah. those are my two moments. So I've got one is um, I, uh, I lobbied to get a speaker on the panel for the roundtable conference last year, uh, Katrina Adams. Um, she's the former uh, chair of the United States Tennis Association, an all around remarkable woman. Um, and she came and, and, and talked about diversity, but also tennis and, and, and how it, it kind of relates to, um, it relates to horse racing. Um, getting representation like that is, is definitely a moment of joy. And the, the other one is, is I had nothing to do with, but seeing Naja as the new head of the New York Breeders Association was, was to me a moment of joy. Just to see other people being recognized. Jonathan Kinchin, uh, watching him on, on television, I guess it's every day now. Um, <laughs> I, can't, I can't get away from him. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but to see more and more voices like, like starting to, to kind of crop up, um, you know, is it, is it, hopefully it's momentum that can be sustained. Um, and, um, you know, I, I want to have more joyful moments like that. Right? Yeah. In, in the vein of hopefully leading to more joyful moments, and again, I feel like I'm hitting y'all with the $64,000 questions. What, what could racing do right now, today, tomorrow? What improvements could they make in the area of DEI that would help move the ball forward quicker, something that they're not already doing? I think, um, <laughs> wow, that's a lot. Um, there are, are competing thoughts trying to escape my mouth. So I, I, I do think that, that the creation of a centralized body that, that looks at these issues through the horse racing lens and disseminates information to others is important because you have a wide range of organizations. As I said, some are small mom and pops, some are big corporate, private, or public companies. Um, and they don't all have the resources. So if we could come together and create some sort of, it, it doesn't even have to be like a, a body that makes regulations or anything like that, just, just something where your information comes in and information goes out, um, where we can get the baseline metrics and information, um, where we have leaders from different organizations meeting on a regular basis to talk about these things. Um, one thing would be if the Arizona program could have a panel on diversity that does not include us um, at the roundtable conference or at the uh, Arizona conference this year, that would I think be something that, that could be done fairly sh fairly shortly. Um, but I think if and if each organization, each larger organization, kind of creates uh, you know more of a, a diversity community or diversity committee as we did at the Jockey Club, that. Ex, you know, goes across their, all their business lines and really kind of delves into how diversity effect, is going to affect and affects their business going forward. I think all that could be helpful. Some of it you can do quickly and some of it will take more time, but. Come on here, add in. Well, in a word, that, <laughs> right? Um, the only thing that I would add to uh, what he just articulated is to if there was those bodies formed, that they be held accountable over time. Right. Yeah. 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 And this may be an oversimplified question, but what does long-term success in this space look like for, for, for you both in this industry? Is it just the representation? What, what, what would you like to see where, you know, in recognizing that this change does take time, you know, people, you know, I know I get frustrated, you want things to happen overnight. Realistically, it takes about 12 to 24 months to get anything moving, but what does long-term success in this space look like for both of you? So going back to Katrina Adams, what she said in, in, that, in that presentation resonated very much with me, and that is if, if you want to be a national sport, 
and I think we all want racing to be a national sport, then you have got to have a fan base and a workforce that looks like the nation. And I think that is what success looks like. Um, nothing short of that. You know, Alicia, you're going to have to start letting me answer the question first. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I'm in total agreement with what he just said. It's okay to say ditto for Absolutely. a good point. Yeah. I, you, you know, know I, yeah. <laughs> so uh, I, I agree. I agree. Okay. To everyone who may be tuning in, you know, watching us, for those people who are here, what would be maybe the one thing that you would want those hearing us and receiving us tonight to take away from this discussion? Well, first of all, um, we are, our website is LegacyEquineAcademy.com. You can like us on uh, uh, Facebook and uh, you know, join in, in, in whatever manner you know, what we're trying to accomplish, whether it's volunteerism, uh, whether it's advocacy, and of course, we are now a small nonprofit, or whether it's funding uh, to help us move forward in our efforts to expose the next generation uh, to uh, uh, the thoroughbred industry at large. Uh, I would like uh, to, or would be remiss if I did not offer to join in what we're trying to accomplish. I would say, um, you know, th this is not easy. I'm, I'll speak for myself. I'm, I'm, it's probably the same for the, my colleagues. This is not easy for us, right? This is, this, I'm way outside my comfort level right now. Um, but I think in order to grow and push through, you have to, you have to do that. And so what I would say is I encourage everyone, recognizing that you're all from different backgrounds, have different interests in the uh, industry, I would encourage you all to continue the discussion and continue having these discussions. And don't worry about am I saying it the right way or do I have the perfect solution? Just, just have the conversation and get out there and do something and iterate on that something until you get it right because it's, 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 there's, there's really no business or no process out there that was perfect the first time. Um. Before I check in with Sean and see if we have any questions, I wanna play Mama Bear for a second and just remind both of you to please practice your self-care in this space too, because like I said, we, this, there is a toll that comes with doing this stuff. So practice your self-care, whatever that looks like for both of you because y'all have earned it. Sure. And that goes to everybody out there doing doing the work practice your self-care all right that was an outstanding discussion tonight we do have some time for questions we'll go to the audience here first and i'll check in online any questions for our panelists please raise your hand and i'll bring the mic over by the way ron max went to legacy or went to locust trace outstanding hi um, this is more of a um, media related question, but um, I've noticed that in terms of diver diversity, the media usually pre presents diversity as more of like a special case and not the normal. How would you suggest the media change to make it see make diversity in the racing industry seem more normal instead of just special cases? I think I think part of it is. Uh, in the industry, diversity is special. Um, it's not normal, <laughs> quite frankly. But, um, but I do think that um, uh, the media could do a better job in, in just infusing diversity in their overall stories, the overall narrative, right? Um, it, it, it's not just about you know Jason Wilson, black executive. It's you know what is Jason Wilson doing to advance, blah 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 forward, right? Um, so those types of stories I think need to be more organic, if you will. And as a journalist, I will also chime in on this too. I think you know there was a there was a study recently that, that came out, I believe, from the Tides Institute that talked about basically the lack of diversity period in our newsrooms um, 
you know, in our media outlets and everything. And we see that lack of diversity, as you mentioned, in the way things are presented, the way things are framed. You know, a great example of that, uh, and I said I don't have the exact stats in front of me, is, you know, we saw so often the protests that, that have transpired over the last year and a half, they were framed as, you know, dangerous and violent. And really, when they stepped back and they looked at the stats, it was something like 95% of the protests were nonviolent or didn't have any incidents. But the way that they were framed, they were framed that 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 that, that certain way, um, and so I think that amplifies the need to to have diversity within our media as well, because like I said, so much of what we we, we don't even realize how much we absorb and how in the lens that it is filtered through. Um, quite frankly, the, the the lens of white supremacy it filters a lot of our messaging, the way things are presented on TV. The way you know you see so often, though, if they're talking about crime, the images that they're using and talking about it. So that is a that is a prime area where the media can can do better. Is it needs to start from itself. It needs to start from within and have better representation in their newsrooms to know how to cover these issues, what to ask, how to frame them, how to how to present them. That is an area that is that is sorely lacking. I've been a journalist for over 20 odd odd years now, and the you know prim obviously primarily in sports i could only recall one other time when i was in a sports department that had another person of 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 color on it you know so often when i am in in the press box i am definitely the only woman of color usually the only person of color period so that i said that that starts with the the media itself needs to do better other questions do we have another question for the panel Tom. Yes. Um, since we're, since the trend is towards the racino format, do we know if casinos are any more or less diverse than the horse racing industry? Of course, we have tribal casinos in many parts of the country now across the river since they bought Caesars. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but does does anybody know with? so many mergers between racetracks and casinos, how diverse or is the casino industry in general? That's a great question. I, I frankly do not, um, but, but kind of going back to my think tank idea, um, that would be one of the things where you would, you would create kind of your baseline industry is like who you're comparing yourself with, right? Um, and, and that way you can gauge what your progress is going to be. But I'd, I'd be interested in their answer as well. So if anybody, knows um, who's out there and could tell us, that would be great. Excellent. It's an excellent question, but I'm not familiar with those numbers. Yeah, same. Like I said, it's def it would definitely would be valuable data if we had it. And like I said, if anybody's out there who has the answer, please feel free to chime in and get in touch with us. Any other questions for our panel? We were talking earlier, and, and I'll ask this question, and Jason kind of touched on it briefly. You know, Ron's going to create these people and bring them into our workforce and get them into these entry-level positions. And we know that those exist in the industry. And Jason talks about making those alliances both above you, below you, and at the level you're at. What's the pathway for promotion in the industry? That's a big stumbling block. Mm -hmm. Where's that pathway for promotion for these people? for these type of people that we're going to bring into the industry? Well, as far as our uh, organization, uh, well, I've mentioned it actually a couple of times where um, you know, we would want to deliver qualified, certified uh, professionals uh, into the industry. And so as you build a curriculum and there is a pipeline, there is a pathway, what happens is the young people, as we give them exposure to the industry, better understand the culture, better understand the business. And so that's the only way to where when you do, you know, build the industry from the top down, you must have qualified, certified folks to gravitate through whatever organization that they join that's in the industry. Uh, again, if, if it, it's the value that our organization is trying to offer back to the industry. 
Yeah, the, uh, so this comes back to the question of culture, right? So um, you, we have, we've got these organizations. I, I was so shocked when I joined the Jockey Club and they told me that the average tenure was something like 15 years, right? I, I come from banking and, I, and, and the law and you know, the average tenure would be like three or four years in, in some of those places. Um, and at the time, I thought, you know, that, well, that's very comforting. You know, you, you, you can go to a place and you can stay there for most of your career. Um, but, but what I think happens is, is at the end of the day, you get people who are stuck in these positions. They're not moving, going anywhere. And they're not giving the younger people any place to kind of go and move up. Now, the challenge for us as an industry is that we're not growing, right? So creating other opportunities for people to move laterally or go other places, um, uh, those opportunities just aren't there as they are in other industries. But we are at a critical crossroads in our evolution in that we've got sports betting coming. We have all this other competition that's coming. Um, we've got racinos and casinos uh, that are very, very interested in our properties. And if, if, if you can create a culture that fosters the ability to move people around to positions, um, I think you'll open up those avenues for promotion. You'll get a workforce that's actually more interesting because you've got people from marketing who all of a sudden are moving over to operations and they're bringing a different mindset and a different way of thinking. And as you do that, um, you'll see those opportunities for promotion and, and for younger people to actually stay in the, in the industry. Um, uh, kind of grow and increase. And, and you know, to build on that, I agree with you because I think that, you know, we heard it a lot when we were developing a program for the graduate programs that, you know, the older guard in racing is starting to step away. And yeah. there's, the, the industry is ripe for new, fresh ideas. The national, um, um, I was reading just the other day, um, there are statistics that say that the difference of salary with African American and their Caucasian counterparts is 30 percent. It's a pretty powerful number. And so, you know, that's the economy, U.S. economy at large. And to your point, well, if that's the U.S. economy at large, just think about the bottleneck that the industry must be. <laughs> right. And so. Uh, that must be addressed. I think too, this is where, you know, when we talk about really changing, I said the culture, as Jason pointed out, I think this is where too, why training, internal training is so crucial for these companies, for them to really, you know, work with unconscious bias training. There are so many different levels of unconscious bias, which as the name suggests, we're not even aware of that could pigeonhole people that that can hold people back you know not to get too far down the rabbit hole but you know you can you know deal with things with a, like you know a, a, like ability pe penalty where you know women who demonstrate the same level of confidence of men they get viewed as not likable oh they're not a good fit things like that so i think there needs to be training done and also a real evaluation of of their policies of their hr policies things like you know if you want to bring in a more diverse force maybe examine things like doing you know you know when you receive a, a resume it's almost what they call a blind resume where they don't have names or addresses on it because people there's been studies that have shown you know, they have sent out identical resumes of people who have, you know, white sounding names and ethnic sounding names. And it is proven that the ones with the white sounding names get substantially more responses, even though they're, though they're identical, you know, in content. Same thing too, you don't want people making a bias off of a geographic location saying, oh, this person's from here, oh, they must be this. So do things like, you know, it can take steps, you know, which it, HR policies almost, it's almost like you need to build in DEI, you know, re requirements and incentives or the way you would build in, like you see a job posting says, must be proficient in Microsoft, must be proficient in this. You need to build DEI goals into your, 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 your companies and have that be part of, you know, of your model. And there are companies who will work with them that can establish those, those things to, to hold them a, a, accountable for things like that. And, and you add to that list sourcing and recruiting and over and above what you just said, 
those companies that choose to do all of that, then that needs to be uh, a, a source of um, accountability and measurement of the progress. And salary transparency is also Absolutely. very key towards diversity. To Ron's point about the, 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 the wage gap, putting things in like salary commiserate with experience, that, open, that opens the door for a lot of unconscious bias to kind of, of, of creep in because historically, women, people of color are the ones who suffer most you know, with, with that set of things. So you know, companies out there, put your salary ranges in there, put your salaries in there, and that is a big part with improving diversity, sure. is salary sure. transparency. Absolutely, absolutely. Last word, Jason? You look like you were gonna say something. No, no, I, these, are all, these are all very, very good points. I, I thought of something, but it's gonna take us on a tangent, and that is, um, you know, we've talked a lot about workforce diversity and, uh, and fan diversity. Um, we should also look at our vendors, right? And the people that we do business with. And make sure, this is a very much a relationship business. And, you know, I, I can't tell you how many times I've talked to vendors and they said, well, you know, we've, we've been your vendor for 50 years. Yeah, but you're gouging me right now. I, I don't care how good this, the steak tastes. I'm not paying <laughs> what you're gonna continue to charge me. Um, I think there are opportunities to look at some of our vendors and, and bring in different voices and bring in different companies that, um, that could serve us better. And I think that's a perfect way to end this panel. A round of applause for our panel this evening. <laughs> Special thanks to our moderator, Alicia Hughes, Jason Wilson, and Ron Mack. Thank you so much. Uh, one reminder, ladies and gentlemen, we'll be back here again in about a month on Tuesday, November 9th. Our featured speaker of the speaker series this go around is Jim Mackingvale, Mattress Mack. You might know him, humanitarian, owner of uh, furniture, gallery furniture down in Texas, also promotes and run, ran Run Happy, a multiple graded stakes winner who ran without medication. So join us on Tuesday, uh, same time, 5.30 to 6.45, November 9th. Once again, a round of applause for our panel. Thank you for coming tonight.